Good evening, everybody. My name is Jenny, and I am happy to welcome you all to Summit Church this evening. Uh, whether you're here with us in the room or joining us online, and whether it's your first weekend with us or you're here with us every weekend, we're very glad to have you. Our hope and our prayer is that during our time together, you feel the love and the peace that God has to offer us. So as we turn our hearts toward God and start worship today, I would like to invite those of you who are able to stand and we'll join together in the scene.
You have led me through the fire The darkness night like no other I know you like a father I know you like a friend I will sing All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing Running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after and running after me. But I lay down, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after and running after me. Your goodness is running out, running after me. Your goodness is running out. you pray with me, please? Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for this church, Father. Father, we also thank you for always being there as a father and a friend, for never leaving us, even when we were down. Please continue to be with those of us who may be hurting inside. Wrap your arms around them. You are so good, Lord. In Jesus' name. Ms. Jeff Huber. I'm lead pastor here at Summit Church, and we're grateful that you're here to worship tonight. Our prayer always is you would experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our time together. Um, if it's your first time with us, we do have a QR code on the back of chairs. Also, it's up here on the screen, and we invite you just to take a picture of that. It'll take you to a little form. If you fill that out and let us know a bit about yourself, we'll make a donation in your name to our food ministry. It's our way of kind of connecting and serving with you right away. But uh, whether it's your first time, we've been here many times. We also want you to know you're not here alone that uh, there are others around you that are part of the community of faith and that God meets you here in many ways through them. And so uh, if you would just take a minute, uh, if you're willing, if you're here in the room, we'd love it if you would just say hello to the folks around you, give them a warm welcome, word of encouragement, whatever we are comfortable, just greet the folks around you. If you're online, uh, we're really grateful that we have you with us as well, and you can check in there. Hi everyone, 
and welcome to Summit Church. We are so glad that you're here with us this weekend. As always, all of our announcements can be found on our website. That's where you can find the most up-to-date information. A couple things we want you to be aware of. This weekend in the back of the sanctuary is our Native Hope. Next weekend, on the 19th, we will have a Native Hope food drive. If you have questions or wondering what you can bring, go talk to them. They would love to give you more information. Now, as you can see, there is a lot happening around here at Summit Church. We just want you to be aware of some of your options while you're here. So, obviously we can't hang out here in the coffee shop for all of our fun times after service. So we have a couple different locations for you. So why don't you follow me? Right up these stairs, there's going to be a place where you can hang out with all of your friends. There's nice couches up there, comfortable hangout area, a little bit more calm and relaxed. If you want to be in a different area, though, where you can talk a little louder, be a little sillier, then you can follow me outside to our gazebo area. And right here, you'll find our gazebo area. Now let's take a moment and prepare our hearts for the message. So this week, I was reminded of the first time I ever really got in trouble. I mean, like expelled from school kind of trouble. Do you want to hear the story? Um, because really, today's epic tale is about how we humans, well, we have problems, we have issues. And uh, I got in trouble because uh, I had an it was the neighbor's fault, really, but uh, we, I had a neighbor that was older than me, and he taught us how to build something called a tenny mortar. If you don't know what a tenny mortar was, I found a picture of one online. We didn't put ours in a little cannon thing. We just put our handles on ours and carried them around like bazookas. And basically, it's Campbell's soup cans. Nowadays, they use Pringles cans, but we took Campbell's soup cans, and you taped them together with duct tape, and then on the very end, you put a little hole in it, and then and the last one, you left the bottom on it, and then you put a little wire on the top so the tennis ball barely fit inside. You throw some lighter fluid in there, swish it around, stick the tennis ball in, light the end of it, and boom, you could hit your neighbor's house with it. And so we used to have these little wars in our neighborhood. I'm not going to give you all the details because I don't want to give the kids any ideas, but I'm just telling you, it was not a good thing as we were shooting them at each other with a lot of dry grass around in the outside of Northern California, and we were shooting them across each other in our neighborhood at each other, and then one of us had the great idea to take it to school and shoot the girls on the playground. <laughs> that did not go well. <laughs> Let's just say I missed some school after that. <laughs> Here's the thing, uh, all of us, we get in trouble sometimes. Sometimes it's something innocent. Luckily, you know, in today's world, that would, you know, that kind of thing would, would, I mean, that would be really problematic. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't have a lot of the school shootings and the other things we have today, but the reality is we could have hurt somebody pretty badly because we were just being stupid and being silly. And we thought it was fun, but the truth is that a lot of things that we think are fun cause a lot of damage, cause a lot of harm, and today's epic tale is really about that. Uh, we're looking at these epic tales because they speak to us. Throughout the centuries, literally, they, they carry down these stories. And we know them, even if we're not followers of Jesus, or in this case, these are all Jewish or Hebrew stories in our Old Testament. And we've been looking at them together. Today, we're going to wrap it up by looking at the flood. Uh, Noah's Ark is what we often call it. And, and this particular story is one that perplexes a lot of people because it seems like, I don't know, it seems like almost like a cruel story. And I want to remind you that all these stories are meant to give us the big pictures of who God is and of who we are and of whose we are and really speak to us about just kind of what it means to be human and to struggle sometimes. Because let's be honest, we all say things we wish we hadn't said. We do things we wish we hadn't done. 
Uh, we make mistakes. We fall short. Sometimes they're big things. Sometimes they're little things. Sometimes people do things to us, and we weren't really doing it. I, just this last week, I'm reading about a car crash that happened on Main Avenue uh, where someone, you know, just was driving too fast and how it caused damage and hurt to other people in their cars. And uh, we've been praying for a woman who was hit on her motorcycle by somebody just turned in front of them. I don't think intentionally, just kind of happened. This is the world we live in. And this story of Noah's Ark is one that kind of captures our imaginations because I think without realizing it, we understand it speaks to us about this kind of brokenness. Now, it's interesting when I did a search for Noah's Ark on Google, 290 million really web pages or hits, or, and it came up with, you know how sometimes when you do a search and it has all these questions underneath it, like the most common questions that are searched about Noah's Ark, and here are the most common, uh, were there dinosaurs on the Ark? <laughs> this is good. By the way, I'm not answering any of these questions, I thought they were funny, so uh, what did they eat while they were on the Ark? Uh, they could have gone fishing, but only twice, just two worms. Um, are there species that are extinct because one species turned and ate the other on the ark? Uh, where is the ark? Uh, and, and that's one of the questions that people are really fascinated by. Matter of fact, people who are really famous and kind of, once again, do stupid stuff to try to find it. Uh, we read in the scriptures that the ark came to rest on a place called Ararat. And by the way, that's in modern-day Turkey. It's one of the tallest mountains in the world. And if you go to Ararat, there's actually a place that's called the Anomaly of Ararat where they think the ark is buried and all this ice and snow and stuff that no one's been able to get to. And one of the persons who went, I, I read this, is one of the persons who went searching for this was one of the stars of the movie Baywatch. Her name was Donna DeErica, and she's been just uh, consumed by this idea of Noah's Ark. And so she went climbing up on the top of this basically snow pound area and there's all kinds of issues up there like you can slip you can fall and eventually she slipped it and fell and like bruised her whole face up and then she posted it on Facebook but then they were worried because one of the big things that happens here is people get kidnapped especially westerners and they get help for ransom so she had to like leave this epic kind of you know, jaunt that she was on. And she said, I've always been just enamored by Noah's Ark and I've always wanted to find it since I was a kid. And I read about it in Genesis 6 through 8. And she said, I believe the Bible, but I just wanted to find this thing. I wanted to find this place. There's something about this story that captures us. Even if we're this you know, world famous actress and model or like, you know, it gets us to go climb this crazy mountain and look for this thing. Because one of the, here we read in, by the way, when the, you know, you kind of know the story, most of us do, of Noah's Ark. But as the floodwaters begin to recede in Genesis 8, we read, so the floodwaters gradually receded from the earth after 150 days for exactly five months from the time the flood began. The boat came to rest on the mountain of Ararat. That's why people go there looking for it. Two and a half months later, as the waters continued to go down, other mountain peaks became visible. And, you know, I, I've just, I've, when I just type in Noah's Ark, you see all these really interesting images and people imagining what the Ark looked like and all these pictures and all these things. My favorite one, however, is this. I have it up on my bulletin board with the woodpecker on the Ark. It's like, oops, who let that guy on? And um, it's actually part of a poster that maybe you've read before or seen before. You probably can't read it, but it actually is kind of a very popular common thing and like people buy it all the time but here's what it says under the poster of the woodpecker on the ark it says don't miss the boat uh, everything I learned I learned from Noah's ark the first is don't miss the boat remember that we're all in the same boat plan ahead it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark stay fit when you're 600 years old someone may ask you to do something really big uh, don't listen to critics just get on with the job that needs to be done build your future on high ground for safety's sake travel in pairs Speed isn't always an advantage. The snails were on board just like the cheetahs. When you're stressed, float a while. <laughs> Remember, the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. <laughs> no matter the storm, when you're with God, there's always a rainbow waiting at the end. Uh, these are all great, really important, kind of funny things, but also a little profound. And, and, and we hear these things and we worry about, did the ark really happen? What did it look like? Could it be that big? I mean, I love all the people that try to, you know, they try to say, well, it could it be that they got all the animals when they were babies. That's how they all fit on the ark, you know? Or, or one of, one kid speculated, maybe they were hibernating a lot of them, so it was easy to get them all on board. Or, or, or maybe, you know, and there's just all these different theories that people come up with about the ark and all kinds of great questions we ask. But in doing that, 
we sometimes miss the point of the story. Because you see, what happens in the story is that God looks at humanity and he sees the things we do to each other, where it's a teddy mortar or something else more extreme, and he sees those things, and it's heartbreaking. Because here's what he sees humanity doing. Remember, we are made in the image of God. So what we're doing is we're like, you can't even see God's image in us anymore. That's how bad it had gotten in the story of Noah. And we read this in Genesis 6. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he'd ever made them and put them on the earth. And then this is the important word. It says it broke his heart. You know, sometimes uh, we think that God brought the flood or whatever it happened because he was angry or wrathful. But I'm always, here's the thing I've just learned in all the years of ministry and working with people, and in particular this is true for men, but it's true for really all of us, that anger and sadness are different sides of the same emotional coin. And usually when there's anger, it's because there's a deep sadness we haven't figured out what to do with. I think of the time I met with a young man who was just always, always angry. And as we spent time talking, he just eventually broke down sobbing and talked about his little brother who took his life 10 years ago and he's never really talked about or dealt with. And that anger had come out in ways where he had been destructive and he had been hurtful, ended up in jail for a while. And it wasn't until he admitted his sadness that he, and really this story is about God's broken heart. And God looks at everything that's happened, and God's heart breaks. And, and by the way, I want to just remind you that all these stories are really Hebrew epic poetry. And here's how we know that, because this story actually echoes in Genesis 6 from Genesis 1. You see, in Genesis 6, we read, God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. And there's an exact phrasing of that in the very beginning of Genesis in Genesis 1. And God saw all that God had made, and behold, it was very good. And in particular, he looks at humanity. He says, it's really good with everything, but he looks at humanity, he says, it's very good. But just a few chapters later, he looked at it, and it was corrupt, because there's this idea that we as humans, we mess things up sometimes. Let's be honest, all of us have done it. We look back, and yeah, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times people come to me, and they said, um, oh, this person really hurt me, and I don't think they even know it. And how do I deal with that? Or have this hurt from somebody who's no longer alive or with us. What do I do with that, Pastor Jeff? But in this story, what we find is that God looked at everything and God was heartbroken. But then God looked at Noah and Noah found favor. And by the way, the word favor is the same word used for Mary. Blessed. God saw that he was, he was a blessing. Noah was. And so, once again... These are meant to be big kind of ideas. That God, even when God looks at everything in our lives that seems to be broken, there's always a little piece, a little person in this, uh, a person, you know, but a little piece, there's still the image of God inside of us. And so God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all the living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I'm going to wipe them out all on the earth. Uh, build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. And then he goes into all the specific details, how big it should be. Look, he says, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on the earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, and, and bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Uh, pairs of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come with you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So I know it did everything exactly as God had commanded. Remember one of the first times I did this story with a youth group? One of the kids said, Pastor Jeff, that means like after this it was all just incest, right? I mean, if you read it literally, that's what happens, right? That's the only way for the human race to continue, for the animals too. By the way, I have rats, trust me, they have no problem reproducing with their family members, okay? But the reality is when you read this story literally like that, try, I always remind people, this isn't a science book or a biological book or a textbook, it's a faith book. And it's meant to tell us, and here, especially as followers of Jesus, we're going to see, we're meant to see something really important in the story. I think it's sometimes 
we miss because we're getting so caught up in all those kinds of questions. And so when I would teach, especially youth, about this, I'd always make them go to Genesis 1 because Genesis 6 echoes Genesis 1 when you read it as poetry in particular. But then Genesis 6 also echoes John's gospel because Genesis 1 begins with what? In the beginning. And how do we find John's gospel beginning? In the beginning. So you're meant to see echoes of it when Jesus comes along. Because God says this eventually when the waters subside. He said, Noah, I'm going to give you a sign of my covenant uh, with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed a rainbow in the clouds. It's a sign of my covenant with you. And here's the idea that, that well, that, that God is the eternal optimist. And there's always second chances. I remember as a kid seeing a, a, a rainbow once and asking my mom, Mom, will you chase the rainbow? And we chased it, we chased it, we chased it. We never quite caught it, but it was this sign of something cool. That was when things were going really rough in our house, especially with my stepfather. And, and then he says, God, when I send the clouds over the earth and the rainbow will appear in the clouds. In other words, even when there's clouds, even when there's storms, and I'll remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures, never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow and the clouds, I'll remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, yes, this is the rainbow. It's going to be the sign of a covenant I'm confirming with you and with all creatures on the earth. All right, so here's where I think there are several main points of the story we just have to get. The first is simple, and I started with this, right? There's consequences to our behaviors and our attitudes. So, hey, when we choose to act out of our humanness, sometimes when I choose to get a little tinny mortar out, I can cause a lot of damage, a lot of harm. When you choose to get in your automobile, you can cause harm, you can cause damage, even without even wanting to. Um, we cause harm. Sometimes it happens to us. Um, and in all of that, we have to remember. And, and, and by the way, you know this is true, because you flick on the channel and you watch CNN, which I call the Chaos News Network, all right? Or you turn on what I call the Foxhole News, because it makes you want to just go hide, you watch any of those, and what happens? You just see all these things happening, and you wonder what's going on in the world. And we see people living apart from God all the time. We're doing it sometimes. And there are consequences to that. The whole idea of this is, you know, God said through Jesus, love God, love others, as you love yourself, and we don't do that very well. There's this brokenness. There's this hurt. And you and I know, you, you and I have seen it. We've experienced it. Um, I love the way E. Stanley Jones, the great Methodist preacher who was a missionary to India, said, we don't break God's law, we break ourselves against God's laws. I mean, they're just ways of being in the world, and when we choose not to, it causes hurt or harm in our own lives and to others. And I love, there was a comedian once who talked about Noah and said, Noah, how long can you tread water? And I love that question because really it's kind of a question for us. How long do we think we can tread water? Um, by just doing our own thing. Um, when I was a kid, one of the things that uh, I watched my mom do was make um, Campbell's soup. You know, speaking of Campbell's soup, and she would make tomato soup. And one time I was sick, and I stayed at home, and she had to go to work, and she couldn't find anybody to come and watch me. And I was kind of right on the edge of being home by myself a bit, and there was a phone right to her classroom. She was a teacher. So I'm home, and I'm hungry, so I start to make soup. And I noticed when she ever turns the stove on, she always put her hand on the burner to see if it was hot enough. But she did it really quick. I did not. And I had like this this red ring on my hand and I'm screaming and yelling and I call her and they send the ambulance and they send the police and they send the fire and they get there and I was just this kid with this smoldering hand and I put it in ice and eventually I was fine. But you'd think I would learn, right? But it was a number of years later, we got this big black tub in the back of our yard that you put these black bricks in, these black little stones, and then you put lighter fluid on it, this fluid, and then you light it, and it makes this cool fire, and eventually it becomes these little, you know, well, it becomes a barbecue. That's how we used to do barbecue before our gas grills. And I remember my stepdad saying, well, just don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. And, and I would always kind of, I don't know, I was an idiot, so I'd touch it, you know, and, and then go stick my hand in the pool or whatever it was. And then one day he wasn't home, and I thought I could do that. And so I went in the backyard, and I put way too much lighter fluid on way too many briquettes, 
and I lit the thing on fire, and there's this huge fire, and I went running in the house and said, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. It just lit on fire all by itself, and now the backyard's on fire. <laughs> and the police and the fire came, and they put it out, and I have so many stories. My childhood was just rough, okay? Here's what I know. I didn't mean to, but I was just dumb, and I lit this thing on fire. We do that. We light our lives on fire sometimes, and sometimes other people light our lives on fire. This is part of what it means to be human, and sometimes we do that on purpose, and sometimes we do it on accident. It's just part of what it means, once again, to be human, and so here's the other thing that we're reminded in the story about Noah is that living a righteous life or attempting to also has reward. It has beauty in it. There's beauty in living according to the way God wants us to live. I mean, God gave us the commandments and the laws so that we would be safe, so we wouldn't burn ourselves, so we wouldn't make these big fires and cause damage and hurt and heartache. And can I just tell you, I've been a pastor for 35 years. I've never met a pastor who's had someone come to them and said, Pastor, I've lived my life according to Scripture, done everything I'm supposed to do, and my life's a wreck. I've never had anybody say that. Now they've said sometimes bad things have happened because there's never, I mean, that just happens because of being human. But, but usually when I meet folks whose lives are a wreck, they'll come and they'll say, I've made a lot of really bad choices and decisions because we all do that sometimes, and our life turns out kind of messed up. And so living a righteous life is about saying, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? I remember one of my mentors said this to me when I was first started out in the ministry. He said, you can never do wrong when you do what you know is right. But a lot of times we don't, right? The Apostle Paul says, I do what I don't want to do. I don't understand. Why do I do these things? Uh, but see, what we're invited to do is to do what Noah does in the story, which is he builds his relationship with God. Um, and that relationship with God is what carries him. And here's the most important part of this story for us today. I, I can't stress this enough. This story is not about God wiping everybody out or coming to get you when you're doing a bad thing. It's actually a story about how God's the eternal optimist. That God is always, and because here's where, once again, Genesis 6 echoes Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together in one place so dry ground may appear. And by the way, it's the same verbiage as the Noah story, the exact same Hebrew wording. And that is what happened. And God called the dry ground land and the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. And it's supposed to echo what you read in the next book of your Bible of Exodus, where you have Moses leading the people out of slavery, and Moses raises his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into what? Dry. That's the same exact word used in Noah's story and in the story of Genesis 1. And so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on either side, and eventually the evil is destroyed by the waters which collapse. Our God is the God of second chances. That's really the whole point of this story. I don't care how bad of a mess you've made in your life. Our God's the God of the second, third, infinite chances. That, that, that's who God is. He's the eternal optimist even at the end of this story. And once again, here's where you have to go back to comparing then this story to the story in John 1 when Jesus shows up. Because do you realize in John 1 and throughout John's gospel, this image, the same image of water comes through over and over and over again. You see, in John's gospel, Jesus is baptized in the water, and when he raises up out of the water, what descends on him? Same bird, a dove. The Holy Spirit like a dove. You're meant to connect Genesis. John, Jesus is the fulfillment in John's gospel of this story in Genesis, and he says, I'm going to bring, the, well, I'm going to bring you a second, a third. I'm going to go to a cross so you can have infinite chances. You can always come back to God. There's nothing you can do that can keep you away from God. And, and yet, somehow, sometimes we miss that in the story because we're too focused on some of the other details and some of the other piece. But I want to remind you in these epic tales that God demonstrates over and over. He's the God of the second chance. Adam and Eve, they get a second chance. Adam, uh, Cain and Abel, 
Cain kills his brother Abel. He gets a second chance. In all the stories that we've read, all the epic stories, David, this king, gets a second chance. He literally brings out the Psalms in his second chance. And these beautiful words, hey, Daniel gets a second chance at life, right? And the lion's at Jonah, running away from God, gets a second. All of these stories are about God, who's a God of second chances. And in the beginning, John says, Jesus comes and everything changes. Because Jesus has been around, really, the ideas since creation. And do you realize, I did a wedding today. And I reminded, every wedding I do, I say, do you realize Jesus' first miracle is where he turns what? Water into wine. At a wedding. To bless that, but also to remind us that water has power. That water is something he will transform. Something that he has command over the water as he walks on water for the first time in John's gospel. Uh, When he meets with this guy named Nicodemus at night in John 3, he says, we must be born of water and the Spirit. The same images you find, by the way, in Genesis 1, where the Spirit hovered over the water and where the Spirit comes and brings the dry land and the water is parted for both Moses and also for Noah. We have to understand that this idea of water is then fulfilled by who Jesus is. This flood of water brings a new creation and it culminates in some ways in John 4 when he says, I will bring you living water to a woman who, well, whose life is broken and fallen apart. He says, water is going to restore. It's going to renew. There's this line, by the way, where he says to the woman, the Samaritan woman, and he says, you'll never be thirsty. By the way, another translation of that in the Hebrew is, you'll never taste death because of what Jesus is going to do on a cross. I mean, one of my favorite images is this one. I love this painting where you see the kind of the dove embedded in the light as Jesus comes out of the water for his baptism. The idea is that this water is meant to wash over you. It's why we do baptisms in the river and here, and we allow people to get all the way in. And, you know, we're going to do our river baptism service tomorrow. And the idea is this, that you go in the water and you come out, something new has happened. You get a second chance. I'll never forget one of my favorite. It was one of the first times we did a river baptism. And there was a young man whose life, he had spent some time in jail. He had some addiction issues. He had all kinds of stuff. And he finally was getting his life together. He finished school. He was doing great. He said, I really want to get baptized. He said, I was baptized as an infant, but I want to just reaffirm my baptism. You know, we met and we talked about what this meant for him. And he just had tears in his eyes. And then we get in the river and I well, like I said, this is one of those memories that just sticks with you forever. Uh, you know, he's looking at me, and he's just got this almost fear, and we stick him under the water. And he actually said, make sure you hold me under for a little bit, okay? I want this really to take. And so I, I put him in the water, and he, you know, I did, literally kept him down, and he didn't resist. He just, and then we brought him up, and he had this huge smile on his face. And he looked at me, and he said, can you smell it? And I'm like, like, what? We just had beans for lunch. I'm a little worried, you know, what's he talking about? Can you smell it? He said, it just smells like newness, doesn't it? As I feel new again. That's the point of this story. The floodwaters wash over the earth, wash over creation, wash over humanity, and invite us to know that God will always make things new. And that's the whole point of this story. It gets lost sometimes as we get kind of wrapped up in it and worried about it. I was thinking about, I brought this table with me today because uh, my grandfather made this. Uh, this wood is actually more than 100 years old. It was actually part of his crib, and so he used it to make this. And it reminds me of the, of the, um, the, the young man who went to his pastor before he was getting baptized. He said, uh, why doesn't God just throw us away when we've messed up so bad? And the pastor said to the young man, well, you work with wood. You do things like this, right? What if you had a really nice oak table that got a scratch on it? Would you throw it away? He said, well, heck no. I'd just refinish it. Make, what if you had an oak rocker and one of the spirals got damaged? Would you just chuck it? He said, well, no. I'd refinish it. That thing could last forever. And the pastor said, exactly. You are meant to last forever. That's why Jesus came. That's why God came in the person of Jesus. That's why I went to a cross. That's why when he was crucified and his side was punctured, there was water that came forth to remind us that there's always living water offered to every single one of us for everything we may have ever done or thought we'd done or wondered if it could ever be made new again. And so here's the question I want to leave you with today. 
today, is there something you're carrying with you? Either you're angry about or you're sad about or something that's happened to you or something maybe you've done that you're just not sure what to do with. Are you willing to give that to God today and let the flood waters wash it away? Because that's why Jesus came. He came to fulfill this story, to help this story come to life for us and to recognize the new life we can have. The second chance we get, we all get. It doesn't matter your political persuasion, your race, your gender, it doesn't matter, nothing, none of that matters. We bring all of it to God. And, and tomorrow, by the way, we're getting in the river. We, I think we have six people signed up. If you like, feel like after this weekend you want to come down to the river and reaffirm your baptism, go. I hope you'll come and join us because there's nothing like water to start over again, to make all things new. And so today I just ask you, what's that maybe one thing you just need to bring? Maybe it's, you know, shooting tennis balls at girls in the playground. Maybe it's um, something more serious. Because you see, here's what the world says. The world says when you get a pink slip, it's over. You'll never get another job. Sometimes it happens in our head, right? Uh, the world says when we get an illness, this is it, this is the end. The world sometimes says, when that person we thought was going to be with us forever says, I'm done with you because I found somebody better, sometimes the world in our head says to us, I'm not worth anything. That's not what God says. God says, you're worth everything. That's why Jesus went to a cross. Uh, once again, I love that image. I love this image. Because it depicts not only baptism, but the work he does for us. You don't have to do anything. You just have to say yes. And that's my hope and prayer today for us, is that we would just say yes to this epic tale that meant to speak to us thousands of years later. Would you bow your heads and let's just pray together. Gracious God, some of us came in today and we're just carrying something that's broken, something that's hurt inside of us, and we don't know what to do with it. We wonder if we could ever start over again, and this is the place to do that. This is what you invite us to do. doesn't mean there aren't consequences. There were consequences for David and for Jonah and for all the people in these epic tales we've talked about. There are consequences, but those don't define us. Our worst thing doesn't define us, God. You define us. We are defined by being yours. Help us to remember that. God, even when it felt like your image had been wiped from the earth and Noah, you couldn't even see it anymore, you knew that Noah portrayed and was blessed and gave that image. And you know that's true of each of us, that we still have that image, that we are made in your image. And that's, in, that's just part of us. So God, help us to know that you see that and you see us sometimes the way we don't even see ourselves. Help us to look in the mirror and to invite you to do something new, to when we take a shower in the morning or when we wash our face or any time we get in the water to remember. Every time we get in the water, every step we ever take in the water, God, is a chance for us to remember, oh yeah, <laughs> this living water is a gift for me. God, help us to say yes to that gift today, to start over, to, to then live into what it is you have for us. God, like Noah, doesn't matter how old we are, You've got something big in store for us. Help us to know that, to remember it, to claim it. Help this epic tale to speak to us throughout the centuries. In the name of your son, Jesus, who came to literally remind us of this living water, we pray. And the people of God said, amen. So, hey, I um, want to uh, thank you. Um, you know, part of our time together is responding to God and a response that we give to God. We do that by singing, but also through our offering, and we have offering places around the room. Also, many of you are giving online. I want to thank you for that. Your offering makes possible, gosh, you're seeing a lot of stuff as you walk out. We're doing a lot of great stuff around the building, um, but one of the things your offering makes possible is uh, it pays for the staff, and I really appreciate that. Um, I actually, I've been doing this 21 years in this church, 35 years total being a pastor, and so I get what's called a renewal leave, and our leadership team here said to me, you need to take it this year. I was going to wait a year. They said, no, you need to take it. So starting this week, I'll be off for a little time. We have great preachers who are going to come in. Because of your gifts, they come in and they will share. We're going to do a great new sermon series next called Spiritual Olympics. 
talking about ways that we, we have Olympic trials and stuff coming up, ways that we can become spiritually stronger, practical things that we can do over the next few weeks. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that. I just want to thank you for that opportunity for me to take a little break, take a step away. And uh, just with that, I want to invite you to maybe take a breath and a step away, a step towards God as we sing together and think about what water might we need to have wash over us this season. So let's stand, let's sing together.
pray with me? Lord, thank you for the gift that it is that we get to gather together and lift our voices up to you. Lord, when the storm is swirling around us and we feel like we're headed in the wrong direction, you are our anchor. All we have to do is remember to stop and turn to you and ask for a second chance and for you to renew and restore us. Lord, you made us to love us. Fill us to overflowing with your goodness and your grace that we can share it with everybody that we meet. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, as we leave today, once again, I want to thank you uh, for your offering and your generosity. Um, uh, one of the things I needed to also share about our staff is Jenny is our newest staff member. She starts this week, and so thank you for leading us in worry. Yeah, woo! So, um, Sal- Sally uh, has been our director of communications, uh, but she had to move with her husband to Florida, and she did remote for a while, and now she's she got a better job So um, where she lives. And so we're really grateful to have... Um, Jenny joining us this week, she starts this week, and so, and you're also leading us in worship, so grateful, so you like had a little break this week, so thank you for being here and doing that. Um, if you need prayer after the service, uh, we have folks who will pray with you, and uh, Julia is down here, and you can make an appointment with her, you can also fill out a prayer request online on our website, uh, we just want you to know that you're not alone in this, and maybe you felt like you've been in the floodwaters, and you've been treading water, and you just need some support, great place to really connect is uh, with our caring ministries. Meditation moments are on our website, you can to read the whole story of Noah and a bunch of other great stories that connect to Noah that we find in our scriptures and go a bit deeper. You're going to get to, well, ask some tough questions and also have some prayer each day. So I hope you'll take that home and that you'll use it. Um, as we leave today, we also have a prayer quilt. It's on the right-hand side over here as you leave, um, and it's for Karen Tucker. Karen is one of the daughters. She's a daughter of Ed and Phyllis Tucker, long-time members. She's got multiple um, uh, health issues, but most recently she has a cancer diagnosis she's dealing with. We tie knots in the prayer quilt, and then we'll get that to her, and she'll have that over her and know that we're praying for her. That's the way our prayer quilts work. And so we invite you to do that as you're leaving. Once again, it's on the right-hand side. It's in this area because the atrium is kind of clogged up. It's right out here. It's still kind of in the sanctuary. Um, Really want to just pray that uh, over the next few weeks, you'll just have a blessed time of going deeper in your faith uh, with our Spiritual Olympics series. We're going to do some great stuff together. Right now, I'd just love for you to, oh, by the way, tomorrow is the altar's picnic and baptism. So once again, you can come right after, it's going to be like about one o'clock at the rec center here in town. Then we'll go down to the river um, and we'll spend some time there. So that'll be tomorrow. So I hope you'll join us for that. Everybody's invited. Would you bow your heads for a closing prayer? God, thank you that you have brought us to this place so that we might know you more fully, so that you might fill us and fill our hearts because your Holy Spirit says hovered over the waters. That The water is literally something that reminds us of your presence. Jesus came to bring living water for us. God, help us to receive that. Even when we just take a drink of water, help us to remember you. When, when we experience that water, help us to remember that you're the God of the second chance or the third chance, that you're always there to offer renewal. Uh, God, thank you for that. And as we reflect on that, as we think about it, may that spirit also settle inside of us that we might reflect your image, that we might follow you, that we might make a choice to live as righteously as we can, uh, knowing that in doing that, we'll find life in you. God, we ask and pray these things in the name of your Son, the Christ, and the people of God said, amen. Go in peace and serve God. Who the...